everyone, this is Heather from the Flourish Academy. It's our weekly q and I have some questions I'm gonna go through, but if you have questions um, that you didn't post in the thread, make sure that you comment below and then I'll just answer them as I see them. Okay, the first question from Stacy. She says, backup strategies. I'm good with backing up on an external hard drive, but what else should I be doing? And my friend Ashley replied with Backblaze. She uses Backblaze. And I know a lot of people that use Backblaze and love it. And I, oh man, I meant to look up how much it costs. It's not that expensive. My friend Nicole Begley and I did a webinar a few days ago on backup strategies. And Nicole uses Backup Blaze. I use, well, locally I use a Drobo. A Drobo RAID 5 array. So the way a Drobo works is it has five, well in my case it's a five, so it has five slots for drives that can go inside of there and you can back up your data to it. It is not my working hard drive. I have an external working hard drive that I use all the time. I have two of them. The one I'm using right now is the Western Digital My Book and I use that to as I'm working on my photos, but then it automatically backs up to the Drobo. So the Drobo with the five bays, five drives go in there, and you can set up certain levels of redundancy. So for instance, if you put two terabyte drives in each one of those five slots, you would not have 10 terabytes worth of backup storage because you're using these drives for redundancy. And what that means, well, they're also hot swappable. And this all plays together because what happens is it writes the data over multiple drives so that if one of the drives fails, hot swappable means you can swap it out for a new one, put that new one in there, and the other drives will rebuild that drive. I've had it happen. So that's what I use locally is a Drobo. Drobo has this really nice feature on their website under the resources that will walk you through which Drobo is right for me. For most of us, it's the 5C, and it's running around $319 right now. And then it also has a capacity calculator where you can click and drag and drop different sizes of drives in all of those bays. And then you can select redundancy or not, and it will tell you what the capacity of that drive would be. Now those drives, say two terabyte drives, uh, right now I wanna say around $86 or $87, but, um, I mean, buying, I mean, you have to buy five of them if you're gonna, you don't have to buy five of them. You could put one in the Drobo or you can put up to five. So that's where the expense starts to come in. But um, there's no amount of money that is worth saving if you're gonna lose photos. So um, Mandy had just commented, thank you Mandy, Backblaze is around $50 a year, which is nothing. Also some people were asking about, um, like Amazon Prime and Dropbox. You can get free storage with Dropbox up to a certain level and then you pay. I pay for Dropbox, just more as a file sharing, less of a backup. And Amazon Prime, if you're a member, it says free unlimited storage of your, wait for it, personal photos. So you can put your personal photos up there but according to their terms of service, you cannot put your photography client photos up there. Uh, do they check that? I don't know, but I follow the rules, so I wouldn't do it. Anyway, that was just a kind of a quick mention about backup strategies. Ashley was asking, when is Leanne's next big SEO course? And Ashley, it is in the works. Leanne is working on something super awesome. In the meantime, while she's putting more things together, she is putting a ton of content out on the Flourish Academy blog. So she had posted last week about misunderstood ideas about SEO. Make sure you check out that post. She also just posted uh, about marketing and getting clients lead magnets. Check out that post. Very, very good. Um, but it's coming and don't worry, we'll let you know. <laughs> Okay, Caitlin says, in the beginning, when you were just doing stuff for friends and family, yep, did you feel over overwhelmed? Probably. I don't know if it's normal to feel this overwhelmed with planning, prepping, doing, and editing the shoe. It could be because I'm slammed at my full-time job, so many projects, it's taking a toll on me. 
well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that if you are busy at work, it probably is taking a toll on you. It's natural to feel overwhelmed when you're unfamiliar with the process. In fact, they go hand in hand. So the more you learn and the more comfortable you get with editing, post-processing, as well as shooting and overall workflow, that feeling of overwhelm should decline. If it's not, then we have a different issue that we need to address. But it's usually just from a lack of clarity that you're not quite sure how to step through the process. And you just have to outline it on paper. I always do everything on paper first. And, you know, just take it a component at a time. And it, you'll feel overwhelmed until you learn more about it. But mastery takes time so the more you do it the better you feel is it is it natural to feel overwhelmed i guess was the question and i would say whenever you're learning something new of course it is <laughs> of course and maybe you have too many things on your plate and then you know it becomes sort of a time management issue but just hang in there it will get better lindsay says if you don't have your target market say newborns maternity available to ask to take photos how do you find them starting out? That is a really good question. That's kind of deep, Lindsay, because what you're saying is if you don't have your target market available to ask, how do you find them? But you have to find them. You have to find them. You will find them. And I, ha I know Lindsay, and hey Lindsay, I know that you know your target market, at least to some degree. You have friends that are in your target market, and if you don't, then it's time to make some new friends or find some new people or immerse yourself in a new environment. And a new problem requires a new approach. So maybe you have to meet new people, but you can find these people. If you get laser locked on who they are, exactly who your target market is, then in your case, you'll, you'll start to pay attention and find her e easier, meaning your brain will be activated to pay attention to find that particular person for you. So if you are indeed very clear on your target market on paper, you read it, you see it, you can visualize it, you know who she is, you will find her. That is just going to happen whether you want it to or not. So you have to get really clear on who she is, Maybe immerse yourself in new environments, but I know that you know people in your target market. You just have to be bold enough to approach them and make it happen. Remember, shy people starve, and you're not shy. You can do it. I hope that helps. Ashley says, how do you deal with travel fees for engagement sessions? For example, I have a session one and a half hours each way, and I waive the first 50 miles free of charge, and my bride is still not happy. Um, how do I approach this? Well, there's a cost, <laughs> there's a price for everything, but, uh, you know, I hesitate with this one because I don't like to put the onus on my client. Really, it's my responsibility to set an appropriate price and in boundaries in terms of where I will go. So many of you know that I live outside of the city of Pittsburgh. I'm about 20 minutes from the airport. I'm about 45 from the city, which is not that bad, but I do have a lot of clients that seem to be in the city and beyond. So I could drive an hour and a half to meet someone. Um, and at that point, I, there's a travel fee. And I say, here's the travel fee. And that's really all there is to say about that. <laughs> it's not really up for discussion or debate um if the client wants to work with you you know i like to i do like to give people options meaning if she she wants to have the engagement session she wants you to go to a certain location and it's outside of your boundaries and you have an established fee structure that's business that's the way it is and she comes back and says mm, i don't really want to pay that you say okay no problem let's meet here instead and then you name a location that's more convenient for you, that you enjoy shooting at. And if she says, no, I want this location, well, that location has a fee, but this location does not. So I love to give people options, but the, all of those options are within my own defined boundaries. You know, if you have everything lined up, your decisions will be made before you encounter them. So I already know how I'm going to respond to something like that. It's just, oh, hi, Lindsay, I just addressed your question, so you'll want to watch from the beginning. But, um, Ashley, the, how do you handle it? It just, it is, I don't know what else to say. 
here's my travel fee for that location. If you don't want to pay it, then you're going to come closer. I am going to articulate that information in the most professional, kindest way possible, but it's not up for debate. Unless it was some location that I really wanted to shoot in or I was going to be in the area. I mean, maybe, but um, no, it's not, it is what it is. Ashley also asks, what flashes are you using for off-camera flash at receptions? So this is actually an interesting question. I'm using a set of Canon 580E Xs, old Canons that I had years ago when I shot Canon. So when I packaged up all of my Canon equipment to sell it, I decided to keep the flashes. Why? Because when I shoot flash off camera, they're always in manual mode. So it didn't matter to me that I was moving to Nikon because I didn't need TTL data to be communicated between my camera and the off camera flash. That didn't matter to me. At the time, actually the triggers that do that, that communicate data, they didn't exist. So the only triggers that were available were boom, send a signal, fire. There was no data being communicated. So actually, if that's the case and you want to shoot your off camera flashes in manual mode, which I always do and I recommend even though I do now have the ability to send TTL data with my other set of pocket wizards and my Nikon flashes, I have that ability, I don't like it. I still shoot with my off camera flashes in manual mode because of the control. Okay, so if that's the case, then what kind of flash do you need off camera? The cheapest one you can find. Okay, no, not the cheapest, because you get what you pay for. But I certainly don't need a pair of Canon 580s, which at the time were pretty expensive. I could use a lower end flash. It wouldn't really matter. I just need a flash that can fire via a trigger. You have to make sure you have the right inputs and connectors and cables and all of those things. But that aside, if I'm going to use them in manual mode, then um, it doesn't matter. I just need a flash that will fire. Really, so I'm using Canons right now. Um, I have a couple of Nikons as well I could use, but I don't. I just put those Canons on. I do have those Canons set up, actually on the tripod I'm using right now. I have a bracket. I don't know if my husband made it or I found it somewhere, but I mount two Canons off camera flash into one pocket wizard with a Y splitter. But I also kept my CP-3 battery packs for those Canon flashes. So I have those mounted. I have a, a large piece of Velcro on my flash and I mount those battery packs on my tripod and I run a battery pack each to those flashes. Why would I do that? Thank you for asking. So it just helps with the recycle times. They're just faster because now I'm running each flash off of 12 AA's instead of just four, because there are eight in the pack, four in the flash. So I happen to have those, so I use them. Recycle times are faster. Why two flashes off camera on the same mount? Because I can lower the amount and also help with recycle times. For instance, if I want one eighth of an output from those flashes, I can set both to one sixteenth because the two combined will equal one eighth. If I have two of those flashes set to 1 16th and the battery packs, what? My recycle time, they're like, oh, bam, instant. <laughs> Which I love because then my exposures are very consistent. So that's why I do it that way. Is that totally necessary? Negative. It is not necessary, but it does help. Okay, so I hope that helps. That's my off-camera, off-camera flash. All right, I am scrolling here. If you have any additional questions, please post them. Post them. Typey type. Brooke asks, how do you create an album proof and then share it with your clients? Okay, two things here. One is I'm creating an album design and I am sending it to my clients for them to proof it. Ah, uh, there are a lot of ways to create albums. Currently, I am creating my albums in either Photoshop or Lightroom. I have some templates set up in Lightroom so it's really easy. I then export those files and then you can upload them to a gallery or anywhere online where you can share them so that the client can 
view them and then make comments. Uh, I mean, you can do it through the gallery that you use, like you could do it through Pixie Set or some or Zenfolio or whatever. Uh, but a lot of people are using Album Stomp. I think that's what Mara uses. Oh, I'm headed to her studio um, in a little bit this afternoon, so we might do a live video over on the Flourish Academy page. But um, I think she uses Album Stomp because it's really nice. A lot of templates, really, really fast and easy. So design the album. My album designs are really straightforward and simple, clean and classic for two reasons. One, I want them to stand the test of time. But secondly, if my clients come back and they wanna make a bunch of changes, I really don't feel too badly about it because I don't spend an exorbitant amount of time on those designs. Um, you know, I spend time on them, I make them nice, but I don't spend days. I mean, I get it done quickly and then if they wanna change it, that's fine. In order to manage album changes with clients, because you should have a system and process in place, because if this hasn't happened to you, it will. Clients will come back and want to make changes, and that's fine the first time, second time, third, fourth, fifth, and then you're like, mm, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I remember specifically in one case, I, I want to make my brides happy. It's the wedding album. They'll have it forever. I'm going to make sure it's perfect. But she kept coming back to me with all these changes, some of which got really wacky. And I gladly did them. You know, here's this change, here's that change. We got about five, six or more changes in and she comes back to me and she says, you know what, now that we've done all this, I think I kind of like your original design the best. <laughs> oh, help me, okay. I said, thank you. And we ordered it and then I put a policy in place that said you can make up to I think I say three design changes and I specify exactly in detail what I mean by a design change. You can make up to three at no cost and then beyond that it's like $65 a change and a change includes the following and I have a list of things that a change would be because sometimes they'll say, can you just swap out this picture? Yeah, I'll swap that out. That's a change. And I should say sets of changes because I'll let them send me an email, you know, with, with some changes that are really more than one and I'll just call that one set. So, and then you just need to find a way to um, upload it and send them a link online so that they can proof it and give you feedback. So design and Ashley says she loves album stomp. Yeah, I've, I've played with it. Uh, I haven't used it, but I've played with it and it looks great. So uh, Ashley, can you let us know how much album stomp costs? Right now I've been doing a lot of that design in Lightroom. I have a system down. It's working pretty well for me. So hopefully that helps. Okay, someone was asking, and then I couldn't find it because it wasn't on the original thread. Someone was asking about enhancing eyes, I believe in Lightroom, or maybe I'm meshing two questions together, forgive me, but in Lightroom, I do have a quick way in order to enhance eyes. Are you ready? Do you have like a piece of paper and a pencil? Because I have settings for you. So I, cre I created an adjustment brush preset. This is not a develop module preset. Nope, 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 two different things. Adjustment brush preset. Adjustment brush is K on your keyboard. So you access the adjustment brush and for eyes, what I do is I take the exposure up to about plus 0.18. I take contrast highlights up to around plus 17. Shadows up plus 14. Clarity, uh, I wanna say is around 18. And the sharpness at 28. So I dial all those settings in. Beep, 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 beep. I saved it as a preset for the adjustment brush, not develop module, two different things. And then you can brush that over the eyes and if it doesn't do enough, you can tweak them. So you might wanna pull up on the sharpness or down on the sharpness or the clarity or the exposure or whatever, but that's my overall eye pop fixing um, that adjustment brush preset. You can create that yourself pretty quickly and easily. If you're in my Lightroom course online, then you have access to that preset. Oh, I think I even sell that preset as a bundle, as part of the bundle for the retouching Lightroom presets on the site. You can check that out, but those are my settings. Um, pretty straightforward. Okay. Stella says, when you have assisted at a wedding, you've worked with a second shooter, and you download photos into Lightroom. She had posted this on my screencast question from a few days ago, but 
I thought I would answer it here because I can. Okay, so you have two cameras photographing a wedding, yourself and an assistant, or maybe you have two yourself. How do you sync them at the same time so that they're in order, so that you can sort them by time taken? Can it be done if you have different types of cameras, like Nikon to Canon? I've had a problem before with two different models, like the Nikon 7100 and her 750. Um, yeah, you can do this and it's really straightforward. Two things. Number one, when before you shoot a wedding, I would sync your cameras if you remember. And most times I do remember to do that. I have three cameras that are working at weddings, uh, myself, Craig's, and sometimes a third shooter. And I sync those cameras so they're all good. But every once in a while I forget or one of them is set to daylight savings time and the other two is not. So I load all of the photos into the same folder inside of Lightroom and I go to view, sort by capture time and immediately I can tell when they're off. Oh man. So I'll go to um, an event, say the first kiss where I know we were shooting it at exactly the same time. It doesn't have to be the kiss. It could be anything that you know you shot at the same time. Then I look at the discrepancy between the times in the metadata. So I might look at Craig's camera and I'll see that was shot at 12.56 and I shot it at 1.52 um, when really the time was three. I don't know. <laughs> no, it was probably two. And I will just make a note of that difference then I will go to the filter bar in Lightroom in the library module. Press your backslash key in order to get the filter. Or is it the forward slash? No, it's the backslash key. And the filter bar will drop down. You can choose camera type. So you can sort by camera type and or serial number. So for instance, if you have two D750s, you couldn't sort by D750 because they would both show up. So you can pick camera serial number, sort by that serial number. Just show me the photos taken with this camera. Do a command or control A to select all of those images and then go to edit capture time and you'll get this big scary warning. Lightroom will be like, oh, you can't undo this. Are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, yes, I'm sure I screwed it up. So I will adjust the camera time and hit OK and it will do it just for those images. So the key here is determining the difference. The differences between the cameras in terms of time, was it an hour, was it 22 minutes and three seconds, whatever it was. Then filtering based on the camera you wish to correct, selecting all of those images and editing the capture time. And I actually do think I have a video on this, Stella. I'll have to jump over to the Flourish Academy blog, but I'm, um, I know I do. I did, I did a video on editing capture time. So that's what you would do. Save yourself the trouble and sync your cameras at the beginning of the wedding and you'll be much happier. Hopefully that helps. All right, I'm scrolling through here. If you have any questions and you want to post them now, would be the time. Someone was asking, Krista was asking what version of QuickBooks I use. Uh, I'm migrating to the online version. I have an older version, but I need to update it. Hey, not on my list of favorite things to do, but that's okay. Hey, do you have any other questions? Because I'm not finding anything else. I'm scrolling through here. Make sure you check out Leanne's post about misunderstood ideas about SEO and her marketing post. Those are all really good. I feel like there was another question that I'm missing. That's why I'm continuing to look, but maybe not. Let me jump over to here. Possibly not. Someone in another group did ask me recently um, about having issues importing into Lightroom. She said she goes to import photos into Lightroom and she navigates to the folder where she knows they're at and it's blank. There are no photos there. And that's because Lightroom believes that those photos have already been imported into Lightroom. That is the only reason, well, they wouldn't be blank, that would be grayed out. If they're grayed out and you can't bring them in, Lightroom thinks that those photos are already in there. Oh, she was saying there were no photos in the folder. If there are no photos in the folder, there are probably no photos in the folder. 
I mean, if you're not seeing anything in the preview when you go to import into Lightroom, check the folder, make sure you put the photos where you thought they were. And if the photos show up but they're gray, that means Lightroom thinks that they're already in there. Now, I have had people tell me, Heather, the photos are not in Lightroom, but they're still gray. Lightroom is saying they're, they're in there, but they're not. Um, Lightroom does not make mistakes. It's a computer. So the photos are in there. Maybe you change something or you move something or you did something. And don't think that Lightroom gets confused over file names. It does not. So even if they were the same file names, Lightroom looks at metadata. The photo would have to be exactly the same if it was thinking that it was already in there. So that's just a, a quick Lightroom tip. If you don't have any other questions, thank you so much. Make sure you post questions next week. I'm trying to post ahead of time so you have time to think and pose questions rather than the last minute so i hope that that helps make sure you check out all of the daily live videos that we do over on the flourish academy page and hey share it with your photographer friends help a sister out okay see you bye